You're listening to Eric Rogel Talks with Warriors, Lovers, Kings, and Heroes, where you'll hear real stories of the journey to modern manhood, told by the men who lived them. Raw, real, and 100% unapologetic. And now, here is your host, Eric Rogel. Hey, this is Eric Rogel, and thanks for joining us on Warriors, Lovers, Kings, and Heroes. This is where each week you'll hear real stories of the journey to modern manhood told by the men who live them. And today, my guests and I are going to be talking about something all of us have experienced to varying degrees, but so many of us avoid talking about. So many of us hate admitting has actually happened to us, and that's failure. See, we tend to hide our failures. We try to forget them. Like there's a shame around having failed, especially as a man. And this is what makes us want to keep them a secret. You know, I know for me, for years, I had shame and disgust around my own failures. And I kept them locked down like they were some sort of deadly virus, right? Afraid people were going to find out that I wasn't perfect in every way. That facade of invincibility so many of us put up as men. So we hide our failures. When in fact, it's our failures more than our successes that have more impact on who we are, on forging us into the men we are, and are actually the stepping stones to our success. And as you'll hear today, it's those incredibly juicy stories of our failures, as my guest calls them, that not only drive us forward, but they're the ones that help drive others forward as well which is what makes it so important for us as men to share our stories of failures with other men. Because when others can learn from our mistakes and and we can learn from the mistakes of others, that's what drives us all forward faster. So does this mean our successes are less valuable? No, of course not. I'm all about celebrating victories, but I'm also all about owning failures as an important and vital part in our achieving those victories. So I'm all about stripping the stigma off of failing and making it not only okay for us as men to fail, but making it essential for us to fail, to experience what it's like to not achieve a desired outcome. Because that experience is far more valuable in the long run. This is why competition is so important, why we as men are drawn to competition, because experiencing wins and losses and training and striving to get the next victory, you know, watching game tape and learning what not to do again, this is what makes us ultimately better. So really, when you look at failure from that perspective, and I have a feeling you're going to after listening to this interview, then it really isn't failing, is it? It's experiencing, learning, growing, and then ultimately winning because it's all just part of the process. And it was a big part of the process for my guest today. His name is MJ Gottlieb. Now, he's an entrepreneur and an author. He's the founder of Lucid App, and that's a digital platform for the sober community that celebrates the sober lifestyle while at the same time providing support for those members of the community who are in recovery or still struggling with addiction. As you'll hear, MJ himself is in recovery. He's very open and honest about that. And he's also open and honest about experiencing the type of failure in business and in life that few men do. In fact, he wrote a book about his business failures titled How to Ruin a Business Without Really Trying. And when his business failed, he lost his house, his car, he had to move back in with his parents, and he mopped floors and cleaned toilets for a year and a half before he could get the courage to start his next entrepreneurial venture. It's looking deeply and honestly at his failures and and what he learned from those setbacks that's allowed MJ to turn it all around and be the success he is today. So I asked MJ about his first business failure. So I started my first business senior year of college, right? And when, after I lost my second business, I started, I'd work at uh, this place up in the Upper West Side, and I would just sit there in the lounge and just write down all the mistakes that I made because I had, you know, I had so much on the inside. So from a really cathartic standpoint, um, I was writing down all the mistakes because I had, you know, they say better out than in, right? And so I was just, I would just every day, you know, before I worked out and after I worked out, I'd sit in the lounge and just write my mistakes and what I learned from them and all this. 
And then a friend of mine, David Belafonte, actually the, the son of Harry Belafonte, the, the famous uh, singer, actor, said, you know, M, MJ, like, it's great that you're doing this from a, a cathartic standpoint, but can you imagine how powerful that book would be? Uh, it, 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 do, you know, do you know how powerful that information would be if you turned it into a book uh, for aspiring entrepreneurs of, you know, really kind of like to prevent them from making the same mistakes that you uh, did? Uh, invariably, every entrepreneur will have their own mistakes. But if, if you take these main, main uh, overarching mistakes, this would be so invaluable to uh, aspiring entrepreneurs. And he said, shit, call it everything what not to do when running a business, right? Right, right. Um, and then years later, I turned it into how to ruin a business without really trying. So let me ask you a question. How hard was it for you back then to look at these mistakes? Because I know like for a lot of guys, especially entrepreneurs, those that have you know, dreams of incredible success, when you hit that failure, when you hit those challenges, it can be really tough to go back, especially after the business shuts down and go, what did I do wrong? Yeah. So at first, when you start kind of looking at your failures, you're like, God, you know, how did I make that mistake? Right. All the judgment and, comes up, right? All the judgment. Yeah. And, on the and, then, and, and this is something that, you know, I'll just fast forward 15 years later, like, when, when I talk to people in, in kind of the recovery space and they're kind of, they don't know, you know, they're, 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 they're green to this whole concept. And this is the same applies to business. I always say this the whole time. When we enter something for the first time, a subject like recovery or a business, you know, you've never started a business, we all come in knowing the same exact amount, nothing, zero, nada, right? So we will invariably make mistakes. Now, once we accept that and acknowledge the fact that we will make mistakes, then what we can do is we can take certain, we could have, we have, there's tools to really mitigate those mistakes. And the number one tool is to learn from the mistakes of others. The challenge that I had I had and still have is all the successful people. Let me take that back. Many of the successful people, they only like to talk about their success. Right. And yeah, the ego gets in the way. You don't want to admit the failures. You want everyone to see you as the success that you are. The power is in the power in everything is your vulnerability and being able to be kind of, relentless and in learning from mistakes, right? And, you know, they say first time, uh, shame on you, second time, shame on me. Well, sometimes with me, it's three and four and five times. But, <laughs> you know, we have to understand that every day that we wake up, we are going to make a mistake, right? Mm -hmm. and, but if we, if we kind of flip and look at it from a different lens, and I go into a store and I buy, you know, a sandwich and that sandwich was horrible. Instead of saying, wow, that ha that's sucked. That sandwich is horrible. You know, I'm so pissed off that I ordered it. I can say, oh, wow, I now know not to order that sandwich again. And, you know, so that's one less mistake I'm going to make at that sandwich shop. Right. Right. And it's also, you know, it looks at, if everything is mistakes, it's everything's opportunity to learn is what you're saying. Everything's an opportunity to gain new experience, gain new learning. You know, with your sandwich example, what I'm feeling on that is it could be learning on the part of the sandwich shop too, because they may not be hearing that the sandwich sucks and they're yeah. going to start losing business. And at that point they need, you know, they would like you to say, Hey, listen, I ordered this. Here's the mistakes that were made in this. If you guys can correct them, you'll move forward as well. So there's opportunities yeah. on both sides. Yeah, a thousand percent. One of MJ's close friends is Damon John, founder of FUBU and one of the sharks on Shark Tank. MJ knew Damon before his incredible success and knows of the failures and struggles he went through launching FUBU. Here, MJ tells me about Damon's reluctance to share his challenges publicly and the value in it when he finally decided to talk about them. 
when I was first speaking to Damon John from from uh, Shark Tank about who wrote the forward to the book, you know, at first he was like, Mike, anyone pre two thousand knows me as Mike. I'm Michael Jonathan, right? <laughs> uh, he was like, he, he was like, it shouldn't it be had a run, you know, a business, you know, without really trying. Sure. And but like Damon is, you know, as intimately familiar you know, with failure and more so, you know, than I, the more, as they say, you know, the difference between a successful person and a person who's not successful is the successful person has failed more. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, Damon likes to discuss, you know, which is really a great thing, you know, that he had to shut his company down five times now to get it right. This was the company that he found. Yeah. Yeah. And then $7 billion later, you know, like, (laughs) I mean, thank God he didn't stop at number th- failure number three, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, if we have more people like that, more people that are who are who are open to express their failures, you know, I like coming in and say, "Here's really what I screwed up at," and mm-hmm. here is how I was able to kind of pivot and kind of overcome that obstacle because that's that is where people need to learn. They don't need to learn, you know, like how big a house you have and how many cars you have and what kind of car you have and the restaurants you have and what you have, you know, oh, the watch that you, you wear. Like, that doesn't teach you anything, you know. In my opinion, it's all about let's discuss the juicy shit. Let's discuss the challenges that happen every day and how we deal with them. And challenges, not problems, right? Right, exactly. If you right. Say yeah. Problems, then you're automatically saying there's a problem. If you say challenges, you're automatically saying opportunity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, challenges teach, Contact right? Risk. Challenges teach. It forces yeah. you to overcome, it forces you to adapt, it yeah. forces you to make decisions, find solutions, and move forward. Problems is usually where people give up. It's too big a problem. I'm not going to deal with it. Yeah, I was saying. Yeah, no, pardon my French, Joe Grogan has one of the greatest things he said in one of the podcasts, and I'm going to butcher this, but he said something like, I don't want to hear a success story. I want to hear about a guy or girl that fucked their shit up and put it back together again story. Yep. Like, and like, that's to me, like everything, right? Yeah, you can learn like, more we, we from that than hear. just hearing a guy was successful all the time. Right. Oh I mean, look, yeah. You know, thousand percent. Thousand. Like I, I'll, I will tell you in all honesty, when you told me that, that Damon John had to shut the business down five times, I had, I think four times. Been, what's that? Four or five times. Yeah. Well, yeah. However many times it was, yeah, yeah. But when you say something like that, I have way more respect and way more admiration for what he's accomplished. Yeah. You know, any one of us could have given up on time one, time two, time three, and just said, look, this is something's, the universe is telling me something. This is not going to work out. Rather than, all right, I learned another lesson. I learned another lesson. I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward, and I'll get it done. And yeah, and, and it's so right because like, and people don't understand that people thought Damon had a, a you know, a, you know, a billion dollar brand, and he was still waiting tables at Red Lobster, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, because he had the ability to put product on celebrities, and but he was grinding. And hadn't been at that, you know, hadn't come to, to, you know, be, because you have to kind of build the sizzle before the steak, right? So to mm-hmm. speak. So he was building the sizzle, but he was still, you know, working and he, he was a, like some sort of a taxi, livery drive, cab driver. He was doing anything and everything that he could, you know, until he was able to get into a position where FUBU actually paid his bills and like so when people would make comments and say oh easy for you you know like they don't understand what he went through and again that's why this is kind of like a call to action for people to uh who have who have gone to the other side of of whatever you quote unquote success is Mm -hmm. let's talk about you know let's talk about your challenges i don't want to hear about like your you know yeah. And I think that helps everybody. Right. I mean, like you yeah. talking about Damon just now, I got some ideas from it just from hearing that. And <clears throat> I know other men will too. And what did you take from that? Cause you know him personally. So, I mean, mm. did that help inspire you when you were going through your failures and your stuff with your businesses? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was such a funny situation because I had licensed my company to Samsung 
uh, America textile and apparel, Samsung, right? So they're, they're based out of Seoul, Korea and in the United States, uh, the Ridgefield Park. And the president of Samsung said, hey, there's this, there's this kid, Damon, coming up. He's got some line called like FUBU, you know, and uh, um, check it out. You know, but apparently he's got some people that are you know, wearing uh, some celebrities wearing his, his clothes. So I was able to see kind of the growth of his company. So, yeah, when, when you have um, when you have people like that, that you've seen their challenges and seen how they were. And he had to make a major pit pivot into Shark Tank because Damon, you know, is an, is an urban hip hop kid, right? Mm -hmm. Just like I'm an urban hip hop kid. And then he was like, oh, shit, I got to like put on a suit and like, you know, take off the gold chain, you know, right? And sure. so he had, and it was, a, it was like, you know, it was, a, it was a big thing for him because he was, he had a, a great message to tell on Shark Tank, but he had to kind of, you have to meet people where they are, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you, pivoting to Shark Tank, he, that was another really big, big challenge for him that he won because he had to kind of take, and like me, like, yeah, I rapped for 15 years, but I'm not going to rap to you right now, right? Because we're mm -hmm. talking about business. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, being able to adapt and meet people where they are is so important for business and, you know, and recovery and, you know, all parts of life. I learned a lot from him and I was inspired a lot by him as well as, you know, uh, a number of other, other, you know, people who I've seen kind of grow through the years from nothing. Right. Right. So. And, and through failure too, I would assume, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And risk and courage, you know, like my business partner, you know, right? my two business partners at Lucid, you know, and, and um, so Jana, I call her my sister from another mister. I mean, she came in here as, as a, you know, from nothing, right? And had a dream. She was a nurse. Right. And, and she, she had a dream to give better health care services. And so she managed to scrounge up some money to open up a, you know, a group home for, for, uh, I think the first one was say senior living and the next ones was children with disabilities. Before you know it, she, she followed that passion and now has 3000 people working for her. So, but it, but she started from nothing. So it's about, I guess, I think one of your seven values is courage, right? right. That's the first one. That's the foundational one is courage. Without that, it's, you've got nothing. So it's like what I see in, in Jana is, um, and what I see in Kirill, my other business partner, Jana's oldest son, is this kind of, this just grittiness mm -hmm. to just push and push and push until you succeed. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that courage is just, and, and the just unwillingness to lose um, mm -hmm. Or even give making failure an option. Like you'll, you're you're going to have setbacks mm -hmm. if you don't. If you do, in my book, if you do not ha have a plan B and you just have a plan A, I am of the opinion just have a plan A because if you have a plan B, hey, if this doesn't work out, then I'll just do this. Right. Then. I'm not going to give 150%. Sure, right? you're not all in on it, right? I mean, it's the old yeah. saying about burning the ships. If you've got a way out and there's a safety net, chances are when you hit the shit, you're going to take it. Burn, burn the ships. Yep, that, that, that is one of my favorite when they came over and they got to the beach and they burned the ships behind them. They yeah. had to win. Right? They had to win. They had no choice, forward or nothing. It's not just being able to face your failures and own your failures. Something else MJ has been an advocate of, especially for entrepreneurs, is cultivating a thick skin, not letting shit get to you or take you down, and how looking at personal attacks as a good thing can help you develop that armor. There was a blog post that I wrote a, a while back, and then it was in Forbes. It was like six ways to gain in, insanely thick skin, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you take someone like Gary Vaynerchuk, who's, a, who's another kind of phenom, right? Like, he just, like, I think it has a lot to do with what you think about me is none of my 
spiritual business, right? Mm -hmm. So like when you understand that and people are like, hey, MJ, you know, you know, when I think of you, I think, I, screw you. I think you're, you know, like, like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way, mm -hmm. right? I actually also love it. It's so motivating. It's like fuel, you know? right? I mean, it's like, it's yeah, like when, inner when fuel you, for you. When you tell me I can't do it, right? <laughs> like, you don't understand how much fuel you are giving me to make sure that I do. Not to prove you wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just like, as Damon says, you know, they, if you're not getting hated, you're not making moves, right? Mm -hmm. So, you're not I mean, pushing hard enough, you're not doing it. Yeah. So it's like you have to have insanely thick skin because shit happens and comes up and loose it every day that could just, 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 if you didn't have thick skin, would just wipe you out, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to really be so used to dealing with adversity. Like I, I, I wear a shirt at the gym every day that says adversity is my bitch, right? Um, <laughs> and adversity is my bitch. Adversity is my bitch, right? Well, it says a B and then I think it has a little asterisk. And oh, C. so it's politically yeah. correct, bitch. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Yeah. And, and it's clean every day. They wash it at the gym, right? So it's just to be clear. And it's, it's like it, it, adversity is fuel. Like, mm -hmm. and if you look at it, like, what would life be if you didn't have challenges and then just everything was just like handed to you, right? I know more people that have just been handed stuff. And unfortunately, I think it's the worst thing that, that you could do to someone is to just give them stuff. Yeah, so, well, they're and miserable too, too, right? They don't, there's yeah. no value there. They don't understand the value and there's no appreciation. I mean, there's a litany of things that go wrong with that. Part of MJ's building of thick skin and handling whatever negative shit is thrown your way is also about handling rejection. And this got my attention because I've always been one of those guys who hates rejection and will avoid asking for things because I hate how rejection feels. MJ told me about a book he read and how getting rejected is actually positive and can help you move forward. There's a phenomenal book out, right? I mean, this is not out. This has been around for a while by Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz, right? It's called Go For No, right? And okay. the principle is, and I was talking to someone the other day about this who's in sales, you know, and he's got to make 500 calls a day and all this. And I was saying, let's call him Bob, right? Um, for purposes of anonymity. I said, you have to read this book, Bob, because basically Go For No is, so, so these two authors, what they did is, so when you have a sales organization, right, you have quota normally. So you have to fill your quota. Mm -hmm. So they said, no, 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 fuck the quota, right? Instead, we're going to give you a failure quota, right? So you cannot stop calling until you get X amount of rejections, right? So they blow past their quota and they're like, shit, I'm not even at 50% of my rejections, right? Wow. So so at the, and then they, so at these large company functions, they had like people, they would award people uh, and bring them up to the podium and say, hey, here's the person that got the most rejections this year. And people, the person, people from the company would come up and get, get the award. And they'd be like, why are they awarding this person? Yeah, for those sure. Out of rejections. And then they would say, here's the person who is, you know, one it, sales, top right, sales. Most sales, right. Most sales. And guess who that person was? It can be the same person. Same person. Yeah. So if you adjust your, to your quota to rejections uh -huh. as opposed to successes, you blow quotas out of the water and the efficiency of your business increases, you know, a thousand. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute because there's some fascinating stuff there. Like I'm feeling it could be a, a number of reasons why that is. And the first of them is, is you take the the stigma off of failure. You take the stink off of getting the no, right? Yeah. It, it's okay to get the no. You almost want to get there. So there's no more fear. There's no more anxiety. There's no more. Go for no. That's right? the name you're, of the book. Yeah, you're there, right? I mean, you, you're going to get that. And then 
I think it loosens you up to just, you know, get done what you've got to get done because you're not concerned with, I can't fail, I can't fail, I can't fail. Yeah, well, it's like, I'll give you an example, another, ex- <laughs> a funny example. When I was in college, I had a roommate and his name was, well, let's call his name Bob again, yeah. right? <laughs> this guy Bob gets around every well, Bob, yeah, right? And he, he'd, uh, I joke about this to my friend Gary, who's um, actually CEO of Lucid. And so he, he would go around campus and he would go up to every girl and say, hi, my name is Bob. How are you? And he'd ask them for a date. And like when I'd be walking across, I went to the University of Colorado Boulder with Bob. He'd stop 25 women on the way to class, right? Yeah. Now, 23 of them or even 24 of them would say, no, like, dude, you're crazy. Get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. But one person on the way to class each day would say, yeah. So he, he struck out 24 out of 25 times. But guess what? He had a date that night. And then for that 30 days, so he had 30 different women that he was seeing over the course of a, you know, a month. Sure, yeah. Right? And it was like, but I was like, God, how does he do that? <laughs> right? The guy had more women than, than you know, than yeah. we've, so. so yeah. And it gets back to that thick skin you were talking about, right? You got to be able to handle 100%. those 24 rejections because you're like, look, man. One of those is going to say yes, and I'm good with that. I can, I can ignore the other 24. Building on the benefits of rejection and getting to know, MJ told me about the importance of not just getting the rejection, getting the no, but getting it fast, and how you're not actually helping someone when you think you're being nice by not telling them no right away. That's something I know I'm guilty of. But instead, feeling the masculine power of being ruthlessly direct. And here's another really important thing about rejection, right? Mm-hmm. I've, so I've had, uh, you know, I, I had four fashion brands, two st- uh, strategic consulting firms, and an agency, right? Mm-hmm. Now, when you have uh, fashion brands, you need to kind of raise money and, you know, that sort of thing. But when, when we were looking to raise money each time, when we would go to a hit list of people, right? Mm-hmm. And we would get a quick no. That was a blessing because we didn't have to waste our time anymore because we'd go on to the next person. Right. It's the people that would say, well, you know, I'll get back to you that would kill us, right? And we'd be chasing around for three and a half months and they say, yeah, I'll give you the $2 million next month, you know, like. Sure. And, they think they're being nice to you, right? They're, they're, you know, they're not coming out with a direct no. They're being nice. Yeah. And, and in all sincerity, they're fucking you over because they're, they're wasting all of your time. Tell me no. It's like the, the, the greatest business people that I've come across, you know, it, when they're in the middle of the, a meeting, they'll say, are you in or are you out? Mm-hmm. Right? Are you in or you're out? Like, uh, you know, our, our PR firm, the owner of our, the PR firm, 5W Public Relations, Ron Tarosian, one of the greatest businessmen I've met, you know, mm-hmm. he, he cuts right to it. Okay. Here's our deliverables. Here's our services. Yes or no? Mm-hmm. Like, don't waste my time, you know? And so, is it curt? Yeah. But in order to, you know, in order, like time, the only thing that we can't do is really, we, we can't, we can't have 25 hours in a day, right? Like nobody can make 25 hours in a day. So, all we could do is be more efficient with our time so that 24 hours could extend that much more. Yeah, you know, I feel when you say that about, you know, is it Kurt, you know, it almost borders on sounding rude when it's, are you in or you out? But I feel like, you know, if you're okay with rejection yourself, you're okay giving the rejection. Right. Because when you're, when you're stringing somebody along and trying to be nice, it's because you've had your feelings hurt. We'll just put it that way. You've had your feelings hurt. You yeah. don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. So you string it out rather than just being, you know, direct and saying, hey, yes or no. And that's mm-hmm. it. Move on. So and I do that, a, and I do that a lot because of exactly what you just said. I've been strung out so many times that when people will call me that are asking me to do something, a favor, or whatever it is, can you mm-hmm. look at? You know, I'm trying to do a startup. Can I? Can you help me with this and that and the other? You know, like I. Whereas I used to be like, hey, you know, let me let me get back to you. I was like, no, 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 no. This has happened to me a lot. Yeah. Let me just tell them, hey, like, 
John, Bob, Bob, <laughs> yeah, so uh, Bob I, right now I don't have the time. I'm so sorry. You know, I'm so sorry, but I, I, I just don't have the time right now because I'm flooded. And so I don't want to be disingenuous and tell you, let's circle back next month. Mm-hmm. So it's like, cause then, then Bob is, you know, the, really looking forward to the next month. And that's something that I would do and be like, well, Joey's really interested in investing the money and says, you know, come back to him next month. And yep. then you come back to him next month and he says, oh, let's go next month. So it's better just to, you know, shoot right to it. And you find that the thicker your skin gets and the more failure you go through, the easier it is for you to do that with other people. Yeah, because I think that we owe it to them. Yeah. I think we owe it to them 100% because, like, you know, my biggest challenges in life has been through people that have strung me out, you know, where it's like you wait and wait and they get pushed off and, and these could be huge opportunities. So we just like to cut right to the chase. Are we doing this strategic partnership or not? Are you putting the investment in or not? You know, it's like, again, pardon my French coming to America. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Who's next? Right. It, it's <laughs> yeah, just yeah. that. Right. It's just, yeah. There, there, there's a, there's a, uh, an elegance to the ruthlessness of that. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, and eventually, even though it may hurt someone's feelings. And so now I'm, I'm really feeling into your like, thick skin philosophy. If you are pussyfooting around and, and worried about people's feelings and you're doing that, it, it's actually, it's a disservice to them. It's a disservice to you. Thousand percent. Thousand percent. Yeah. I got into a discussion of our sacred seven core values with MJ. And remember, those are courage, honesty, integrity, commitment, duty, honor, and love. And I asked him about courage, particularly around getting to know fast and cultivating a thick skin, as well as the courage to look at your failures. And he told me how he was raised in fear by his father, something I'm very familiar with, as you're about to hear, and also how MJ turned to alcohol as a form of liquid courage. Growing up, my father, and who I loved dearly, and it wasn't his fault, you know, he was just trying to be, you know, the best dad he could. He was very overprotective, right? So he would, you know, encourage me, listen, don't ever take a risk, right? So if it was asking, you know, a girl out, you know, my mother would say, so ask her out. And my father may say, well, what if she says no, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and listen, he was just trying to protect his, his, his baby boy. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel you because my mother was the same way. She raised me, I, you know, my joke is my mother raised me like a veal. Right. I could never get bumped or bruised or damaged in any way. So right. whatever you could do to protect all of that, you had to do it. So I'm yeah. And, and so like, because of that, I could hardly open my mouth, you know, to women, to anybody. And what I found, the only way that I could really be fearless was when I put alcohol in my body the first time. And then I was like, wow, now I have this liquid courage and like suddenly I'm better looking, all the women love me or so I thought, you know, and it's like this, it was this magic magic elixir that, that the fear went away and got replaced by a false sense of courage, right? And, you know, for a a person like me that cannot uh, drink with impunity, it was, it was nearly the death of me. So I needed those alcohol and other crutches for decades, many decades, in order to uh, overcome that fear that was put inside of me as a young kid. What got you through that when, when you got past the alcohol and, and, and using that? What got you past that fear? What was that um, for you? Fa- fa- facing, like, so I have a friend, um, a dear friend of mine that it's funny. It's not, it's interesting. He, he used to run one of the lar- you know, the largest, uh, you know, live nation. He was the CEO of global music for live nation. And he like kind of left everything because he realized all, all the, the, the money in the world, he had a hole in, in his heart. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, like it didn't do anything for him. Right. And you That's know, so, a lot of people make by the way. Yeah. And, and money and the things are going to fill what's going on in here and it can't. So, yeah. And, um, and his name is Jason Garner. 
And uh, he wrote a book called End I Breathed, um, incredible book, because he came in from a trailer park and he ended up being, you know, CEO of Global Music for Live Nation, the largest, you know, music venue company in the world, right? I left it all, went to the Shaolin Temple and uh, started learning from the monks. And now all he does, Ram Das, Sharon Salzberg, all the greatest kind of meditation and um, spiritual masters or whatever you want to call them. And so he would tell me, like when I would say, hey, I'm in pain or I'm in fear, he'd always say, wow, that's, that's great. Sit with it. Feel the fear. Yeah. Like, like sit with it, you know? And, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I want it gone. <laughs> you know? Just get it away from me. It's yeah. bad. I don't want to feel this. I want to give a bit more perspective on what MJ is saying about sitting with the fear. There are a couple reasons why this is really effective and how we look at it from the self-discovery teachings that I practice myself. Sitting with your fear and pain is all about not resisting it because that just makes it stronger. The wanting it gone, the wanting to run from it, it being uncomfortable, this is what gives it power over you. But when you drop that and you drop the charge you have on it and just sit with it from a perspective of it not being bad or painful or wrong, rather it just is, then you can use it as fuel instead of it defeating you. And MJ understands this. He also understands the power in his life of what he consumes and what he surrounds himself with which is why he's always conscious of immersing himself in motivating messages whenever possible. I need to constantly be surrounded by people who have, again, back to that Joe Rogan, who have gone through such adversity. And like I go to the gym every night, right? And people think I'm listening to Jay-Z or whatever it is. I'm listening to snippets of motivational comments from David Goggins to Elon Musk to Richard Branson to, you know, they're, they're these things that you can get on, on, on uh, you know, I, iTunes, you put in motivation or whatever, and they play a little background music and they take snippets of could be Les Brown, Eric Thomas, who is homeless and, uh, you know, uh, David, Go all these people, all the entrepreneurs, you know, um, sure. and you, you understand their perspective and you get these nuggets of wisdom like Richard Branson says, if, if you go, go and start a business and you put everything you have into it and ultimately it doesn't work, I have no regrets. So like to hear that from someone like Richard Branson, right? So like, but if you know that you've given everything, then there's no regrets. Then you're taking a guy that's incredibly successful, right? And knowing that he is saying it's okay if you leave it all on the field. You yeah, know? and it's okay if you fail. So, you know, what I'm getting from what you're saying on this is the importance of what we talked about earlier, sharing these stories of failure, right? Being open about these stories of your own failure, your own rejection. It's yeah. that, um, you know, the courage to do that is what's going to help and inspire others because it's what helped and inspired you and got you through it. Yeah, so that's... So to answer your question, that's, you know, I have those, anytime that I'm not working, I'm listening to motivational, you know, uh, mm -hmm. things, or I'm speaking to, you know, someone that's been through hell and back in recovery or whatever it is. And, um, you know, just something that has to do with overcoming adversity, because the way MJ Gottlieb is set up, when I wake up, I'm in fear. That's how I was as a little kid. Mm -hmm. Right. And I have to immediately put something inside of my head to, to say, hey, you know, f no, no, fear won't live here today. You know, but I need to constantly fill that into in my brain from the moment I wake up to the moment I have any spare time or I'll, know, I'll go right back to fear. Yeah. Well, that fear motivates you then. Then again, looking yeah. at it from the positive side, you know, having that fear and doing that is what motivates you going forward. So, well, they, yeah, I was just going to say, they, they say that, that faith and fear are strange bedfellows, right? So, like, they can't be in the same place. So, you, you either operate in faith or you operate in fear. So, so, like, with me, if I am feeling fearful, I will immediately then move to someone who is showing something of faith, 
mm-hmm. and then it'll, it'll switch me. So, so fear motivates me to switch to faith. Right. That fear is that motivation. You shift it over into the positive, right? So that's yeah. you know, like when I said earlier, fear is fuel because that's yeah. how I operate, right? We, so I guess we were kind of brought up similar, brought up in fear rather than brought up in courage. I know a lot of men who were brought up in courage. Some of my men yeah. grew up that way, where it's like, you can do anything, get in there, just do this. I was the complete opposite. So for me, when I feel that, it's shifting into the power end of it, right? Yeah. It's not going to take me down, to put it that way. That fear is there, and I look at it and go, okay, it's there. It's an old friend. I'm going to shift it over into this. Yeah. yeah. When MJ lost his business, he also lost his house, his car. And because, as he'll tell you in a moment, he was too embarrassed to get back into the fashion industry. So he spent time mopping floors and cleaning toilets, doing whatever it took to build his way back up, even though he was dealing with depression over what had happened. When I lost my business, my first business, I lost everything. And like you said, I I went chapter seven, you know, liquidation and company personal, put my furniture on the lawn, repoed my car, you know, everything and moved back home with my, with my parents. And just, I didn't even want to enter the fashion industry because I was too, you know, embarrassed to even show my face. We went out of business in a day. Um, in a day. Yeah. We trusted someone and we showed up at the factory and, and all of our go- goods were gone. I actually took my first vacation in seven years and my business partner called me and he said, uh, yeah, everything in the warehouse is gone. And, um, and so they, they stole it and they try to sell it back to us for double and, you know, it was craziness. So we lost the business in a day. So I didn't have any money for, uh, to take the, uh, the, the train or the bus, which was a dollar 50 at the time. And we had tokens. Uh, this was, uh, 1996. And so I would walk from 20th street to hundred street with Gary again, who's my best friend and is now CEO of Lucid. We go to hundred street and back every day, you know, looking for any kind of menial kind of job. And we got this job working at a bar, mopping floors, cleaning toilets. And it was run by this kind of crazy guy. And I had gained all this weight. I was so depressed and, um, this guy and and it was kind of like a hip joint right mm-hmm. and our responsibility was also there they well, you could smoke back then so there was this vip room and so all the women they you know it would be on the couch with the with the guys and bottle service and all that and our job was to kind of go take their ash you know their cigarettes and you know mm-hmm. clean their ashtrays and then you know the guy we'll call him bob <laughs> who was the uh, owner of the, of the bar would say and he knew from my history uh, of me owning a business. He'd say, hey, Fat Mike, the president, someone clean, someone threw up in the second bathroom. Clean it up, you know. Yeah. And so uh, um, I would go and I'd mop the floor and, you know, and, and th- so it was a, a very humbling experience. You know, when that happens, you're not in that mode of, of uh hey, this is going to be a great because God knows how many years later I'm going to be able to look back. You're kind of going through what you're going through. Right. Yeah, you're um, in it. You're knee deep in it at that point. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, you know, that we, we started being these celebrity barbacks and uh, the, the people would come in after um, happy hour. Uh, we'd start giving them and have these business discussions and Bob would get mad because he's like these 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 businessmen are coming and they're getting advice by my bar backs. Right. He's like, this makes no sense. Right. And yeah. then one of the guy says, Hey, why don't you come work for me? And so we got a job in real estate, you know, and then Gary and I started our second business. And then we were kind of back to the races again. So was there a fear in getting back to the races and fear in opening up that? Oh, second yeah. Business? Yeah. Yeah. There's fear, you know, every day I wake up. So it's like, again, it's, it's, you know, and to have someone who, you know, believes in you and have a running buddy, like, like, like I did with Gary, you know, um, and the thing about, again, this goes back to kind of people that you look, look up to. So Gary is fearless, right? Mm -hmm. So he's a, his, his father was a colonel in the air force and, you know, his father's like, just know. If a, if a kid tries to kick your ass, I will not be there to help you, right? 
Mm-hmm. Just know if a poisonous snake goes to bite you, I will let the snake bite you. I'll wait a few minutes, then I'll give you a lecture on, you know, the whole don't get near poisonous snakes. Then before you die, I'll suck the poison out, you know. <laughs> it, 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 so, so he so was like, very much into experiential learning, his father. It, it, so, yeah, it, so, so, so Gary went to 15 schools in 15 years, right? Uh-huh. Um, and so he had to make friends each time and all that. So he was brought up, brought up the opposite of me, right? Mm-hmm. Where it was like, no, don't let anybody touch, you know, MJ. It was with him. Yeah, get your ass kicked. I ain't gonna, you know, like, and, and he, he was a very, it's not like he didn't love his uh, uh, Gary any less than my father loved me. Mm-hmm. He just, and so Gary's just fearless. So like not reckless, but fearless, that's a great distinction and perspective to have on the difference between being fearless and being reckless. Fearless is not letting fear hold you back. That's the guy you want on your team. But being reckless is jumping into things without any thought or planning, and that's not the guy you want. Now, besides being fearless, MJ's partner, Gary, also has a fantastic perspective on handling a bad situation. When we were losing that business, I was freaking out. And I've never gotten upset with Gary in my life, except for this one time. So I said, why are you not freaking out? Like, <laughs> what the fuck? You know, we're losing everything. Do you not right? care? Are you not upset about this? And he just says, what exactly would that accomplish? And I was like, I was like, this motherfucker. Mm-hmm. You know? And I was just like, and it's why I call, kind of call him Dr. Spock. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, so having someone that that's able to kind of, you know, that you, that, ha- that, that's fearless. Right. Balances um, you out on that side. Balances you out. Yeah. 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 So looking back on the, on the, on the failure and losing that business and everything that just happened, would you trade that for anything? Like looking back now, is that one of the more valuable experiences in your life? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's like, and it, even it, it carries on to people who, like when I'm in a restaurant and there's a bar back, I make sure I get to know the bar back's name. And people are like, why are you asking for the bar, buck's name, bar, bar back's name and see how their day is and all that? And I'm like, because I was that dude. When I see the person mopping floors, you know, at the gym or whatever it is, I make sure that more than anything, I recognize that person, ask how their day is and all that, because I've been that dude, right? So I think that, you know, it gives you that, uh, and then obviously the addict on the street, same thing, you know, I won't give them money because I know what that will do. They'll just go and cop like I used to, but I'll sit with them, right? And I'll talk with them and I'll ask their name and We'll just, you know, we'll talk for a while and let that person feel like he or she is a valuable person. Yeah, and that, that's really important. That comes, I think, um, you know, we talked about the, the core values, right? From courage was what we talked about mostly, but now that comes from love, right? Yeah. That's purely coming from love and understanding because yeah. you have been there and you haven't forgotten. And I think that's part of when we talked about going through these challenges, going through this adversity, because you can treat somebody who others who may have been handed everything would look down on and not value. And you yeah. can see that from your heart in what they're going through and who they are. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 and I'm particularly like, I don't have really tolerance for people that don't treat, you know, people that, that have to go through those steps, you know, and they say, Oh, what's going, what's going on with our waiter? You know, mm-hmm. like, like, that don't understand, you know, you, you have had to be that waiter in order to understand the challenges of, you know, so, so yeah. like, I, I, I don't have too much tolerance for people who aren't really um, kind of kind and loving to those, what they say, non, they call it the non person in meditation, you pray for the non person. So it could be the cab driver, you know, that, 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 that brought you to the airport or whatever, you pray for the non person. And not non-person being they're not a person, but the person that you haven't become friendly with, 
Mm -hmm. right? And you just kind of give mindfulness to that person. It's a love and appreciation for everyone that's out there. And I think it's, it's the sign of a, you know, a true man, we'll say, to be yeah. able to do that and, and do that openly and understand and have that love and appreciation for whoever it may be that's out there. Yeah, 100%. MJ has written in his book about the four steps to starting a business. We went over them, and as a man who has failed at several businesses, he gave me his explanation at how he arrived at these four steps and why your motivation for starting the business in the first place is so important. You say when you're starting a business, you have four steps in starting a business. And I want to just get into these real quick because the first one is what is your passion? Mm -hmm. And the second is who do you want to help? Third is higher purpose, and four is what really drives you. And as we're talking about this love and appreciation, it's and coming from the heart. You know, the first three really cover that. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, you, when you when you look at it, you know, what's your passion? What do you really want to do? I know so many people. I'm sure you do too. Who get into business for money, or they think yep. it's going to be lucrative, or it's going to you know yep. whatever. But you have experienced that side of it. So tell me why that passion is the first one for you. I mean, I can tell you firsthand, and if you start a business for the purposes of making money, you're going to fail. And I mean, you may actually, quote unquote, succeed by having money in your pocket, but then you'll have money in your pocket with a very kind of empty life, right? Um, But I don't think you'll even get to that point because money is not a purpose, right? And uh, money is not a passion, right? So if you're passionate for what you do, then... You know, they say, if you love your work, you're not working, right? right. Well, Lucid is challenging as, as hell, right? Mm-hmm. We're building a digital platform the, for, for those, for the sober community and those who want to be sober and, and has all these various components and the technology space to build it, a, a, a product like that is an exorbitant undertaking. Now... The passion behind that was, well, we said, well, number one, we could either open up a rehab, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then another, and then, you know, even if we open 5,000 rehabs, you know, we may be able to reach, you know, 40,000 people, right? And help 40,000 people. Well, there's, there's, I mean, there's over 40 million people uh, in recovery and trying to get sober, right? Mm -hmm. And then the whole sober people who are sober, uh, upwards of uh, over one third of the adult American population. So you're talking all together over a hundred million people, right? The best way to do it is to bring them all into one place. It's really hard because you're, you're trying to create all of these features, you know, to give, because everybody is going to like different parts. Somebody's going to like the event. Somebody's like, going to like the sober travel. Somebody's like going to like the dating you know, the sober dating, so someone else is going to like the suite of recovery tools, but also someone's going to hate, you know, some part of something. And so like, so like you have to kind of find a middle ground, make sure people play nice and try to kind of give the best experience to the person that's coming in. And, you know, you're always going to, while you're building the product, you're always going to have, I mean, bugs and all this stuff that comes with technology. What you're saying is you have to be passionate about what you're doing in order to make it through all of that. Yeah. Well, a hundred percent. Like I can't sit like right now I'm sitting behind, you know, the majority of my time is sitting behind a desk 18 hours a day. I like being on the front lines, helping people from the standpoint of like, you know, being out there. Mm -hmm. But in this juncture of the company, it's just being on the phones all day with development teams and strategic Mm -hmm. partnerships and this and that and the other. And like, it's not the part that I like, but I know if this is going to help, you know, 50, a hundred million people, then I'll, I'll sit behind a desk for as long as I have to until, and then allow myself to get out there and really, you know, start, helping change policy and all that stuff because at that point lucid will have a much a voice and a platform that's so strong that when we speak everybody hears so. and then that's what keeps again that's that that passion is what keeps that commitment is what i'm feeling 
100 percent. I mean, you can commit to sitting behind that desk for 18 hours a day because you are passionate about it. And if you don't yeah. know, feel about the failure, too. I mean, if you're if you're really passionate about something, you love what you're doing, you're committed to it. The failure. Doesn't stop you. Challenges Correct. don't stop you. Correct. Yeah. 100 percent. And also and then getting into the second thing is who do you want to help? Right. So if you've got passion and purpose, who you're helping also drives you too because you're committed to them as well. That's what you're committed to. So like, I mean, because every person who is now so sober was once, try, you know, was once trying to get sober, right? Now, if I had not gotten sober in, in March of 2012, I'd be dead or in prison. I'd be in prison, uh, most likely in prison. So I owe my life to sobriety. So the people who have not been able to see themselves on the other side, knowing that they are, their chance of getting to the other side is 100%. When MJ told me that about how he'd most likely be in prison right now had he not asked for help, I wanted to know if he were mentoring a younger man who wanted to get into business, what would be the most important lesson he would pass on to him? I mean, I would say, say the three words that nobody wants to say in business um, or recovery. I need help because I think mentors are like a really big thing. And people, you'd be very surprised how many people are willing to help if you're only able to put aside your ego and say those three words. In recovery, those people that don't say those three words die, right? It's death, jail, right? Or insanity. To be able to say, I need help. And, you know, also for them to understand the power of mistakes and that there's, there's a lesson, you know, in everything. And, and they also need to understand kind of like that it's true. You have to kind of, as Gary Vaynerchuk says, work until your eyes bleed. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be obscene the amount of work that you need to do if you're an entrepreneur you have to know that that's coming, mm -hmm. right? And be okay with it, right? And accept in, it. In advance <laughs> and be like, listen, I've defined what I'm trying to do here. And I understand that there's going to be a gazillion battles along the way. And I have to be okay with that mm -hmm. because nothing ever goes according to plan or as the saying so everything is always perfect. Everybody has a perfect plan until you get punched in the face or whatever. Yeah, that was my Mike cut. Tyson. Um, Everyone's right? got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like you had, and so you have to be willing to pivot and, and, and adjust and, and really learn from other people's adjustments. And really when you're speaking to a success, whatever you would call successful person, mm -hmm. ask them, you know, their pivot points, ask them their challenges. Don't ask about their successes. Like that's just a waste of time. Oh, I agree. Yeah. The failure is the most important part, right? I want to learn what you learned. And the only way to learn that is to get your ass handed to you a few times. A hundred percent. Right. hundred percent. Yes, sir. With all his openness about his failures and struggles, I asked MJ what he wanted his legacy to be. I think the legacy, you know, is really about showing people that they're as powerful as their story, right? And like the more fucked up your story is, the, the greater ability you have to help people mm -hmm. um, when you turn it around. So um, to really tell people that they're, what they perceive as their quote unquote shitty hand is actually their greatest asset. So, and yeah, that well, ability to help other people. You yeah, know? the reason why you can do that is you've been through it yourself. You're talking from experience. Yeah. Right, you're yeah. not someone who's lived, well, I mean, I don't want to say a charmed life, but I mean, you know, when you get these people come in and go, oh, it'll be okay, I know it'll be okay. Yeah. Way different than hearing it from someone who's been through it, experienced it, come out the other side. So, I guess yeah. the thing is that example is what's important. You, you understand them because you've been there. And then you can show them that, hey, it doesn't always have to look like this. Yeah. And even when I speak at, you know, prisons or stuff like that, and they, they say, hey, but look, look at you and look at me. We're nothing alike. Mm -hmm. And then I explain, I, I'll show them a picture of like my last trip to the intensive care unit and let them know I was that person 
without a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of that had the airplane bottles in all my pockets just so I can have alcohol on me at all times and, you know, and, and couldn't go a minute without doing cocaine. And, you know, like I was at the very end of the rope, you know, and, um, and then, and then I, I said the three words that, that is just the hardest thing to say because it requires you to put away your ego. I need help. So like, I think that in order to do that, you need to show the power of, of vulnerability. Um, so, so yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's so important to show people that, you know, you know, where you've been and then you can identify the, the pain and how they can use that pain as their greatest weapon. Yeah. And, that, and that's the courage to do that, right? Because vulnerability takes tremendous courage. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's that vulnerability and that courage to be open and real with each other that binds us together and moves us all forward. There's so much to benefit from what MJ says about failure and cultivating a thick skin and being open and honest about your challenges. So I got the men of the round table together, as I always do, to get their takeaways from what he said. Now, I'm going to air the full discussion in a couple of days, so make sure to listen to that one. But I wanted to give you a few clips. And in this session of the round table, we've got Mark, Tom, John, Barry, and Alex. And Mark is going to lead us off with how he sees that failure isn't the opposite of success. It's part of success i coach a lot of entrepreneurs and things like this and the thing that is that we constantly go over is that failure is part of success it's like i was talking with one guy one day and i said you know failure is not the opposite of success it's actually part of success and the way you embrace it you know, whether it's, whether it's fear or pain or whatever, it's like, stop looking at those as negatives and look at those as part of the process that it's going to steer you in the right direction. Here's Tom about learning from failures and using them to pivot. I think the other thing that was, that was really cool about NJ and, and you see this and how he's read, how he's looking at other entrepreneurs for guidance and how he does the same for young entrepreneurs is again, this kind of notion of don't ask about the successes, mm -hmm. ask about the failures, but also ask about the pivots. And, and, you know, that really strikes me as an entrepreneur is rarely do you start a business or really anything in life where tra the trajectory is a straight line. For those who have been successful, you pivoted the business, you know, something doesn't work out, but if they, uh, that ability to stop, you know, restructure, change course, that's the mark of success. John talks about getting to know quickly. He just talked about being honest in business. Like, look, I have this thing. I'm, I'm talking to you about something. I want to do business with you. You know, are you in or are you out? Make a decision. Let's go. And, and all oh, this that's time, what he was saying. get to know as fast as possible. Exactly. And then just like get to the point, just be real. Let's get to the point. How much more efficient could we be in business if we cut out all that, you know, little game that you play with somebody and just like, look, I, here's what I got. I'm going to answer your questions. We can, you know, I can help you out with anything you need, but okay, are you in or out? Done. And I can feel where I actually hit that point with some of the sales that I'm doing with people. I would, I would kind of fall into that trap of, Oh, well, they'll call me back next month or I'll better follow up with them. And, you know, there's only so much of that you need to do. And I actually now when I talk to people, I, I almost say that. Are you, are you in or are you out? And it yeah, makes it so much more fun. real. I'm respecting that person's time. They can respect me. I'm not going to take it personally. Okay, great. Let's move on to the, to the people I can focus on more. And Barry's takeaway is around how some things work and some things don't, but it's all part of learning. I found this interview so refreshing to hear a guy who is such a success talk about how it's just failure gets you there, you know, and making those mistakes and, and fucking up and, and stepping up and learning from the mistakes. And it really got me reflecting on my life and um, how it applied. And, you know, I've been in business 25 years in my chiropractic practice, a place for healing and you know, be in business 25 years, you got to do new things and keep it fresh or, you know, you could get burnout. So, you know, I'm constantly trying new things and I have been and some of them work and some of them don't. And 
you learn from the ones that don't and you move, you put your energy into the ones that do. But if you don't try it, you never know. And finally, here's Alex on putting more emphasis on the win. When you're training a dog, you teach them to sit. As soon as their ass hits the ground, you say yes. And it's like a big emphatic, like, yes, awesome, good job. And the no corrections when they're not doing it right are a lot more subtle. Like, no, 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 that's not it. They do it right. The emphatic is more yes. You know, when I'm feeling around all these failures and training my own psyche, you will say it's failure. A lot less emphasis because right now in my life, you know, if I came up on a failure or a challenge, I'd be like, God damn it, son of a bitch. How come you didn't see that? You know what I mean? Like, fuck, fucking stupid. I didn't see that coming. I should have seen beat it coming. Myself up about I it. really yeah, beat myself up over it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Whereas, you know, this model builds a much more healthy psyche. Like, nope, let's correct. And then really just celebrate in the wins even more. It's a better balance for my own life. Like, okay, challenge. Nope, that wasn't quite the right thing. Adjust into the right thing. Yes, back on the win. Sweet, let's get it. I want to thank the men of the round table for their insights. And I think for us, becoming more and more okay with failing is the key to success. And in my mind, it really isn't failing if you take the experience and lessons from whatever outcome you get and apply that to being successful going forward. And now I want to know what you got out of MJ's story. Are you more comfortable now looking at past failures as simply experiences and paths to learning and growing more? Let me know. You can find me on social media. The links are on our website, wlkhpodcast.com. Just click on those, find me, and leave a comment. Also, remember to subscribe and rate us and leave a review and comment. Most importantly, make sure to share this show with men you know will get value from it because I'm sure you can think of at least three men right now whose lives you could help change for the better because of what MJ said. So please pass it on. And I want to thank MJ Gottlieb for joining us today, for being real and honest, and for telling us the story of his journey to modern manhood. And I want to thank you for listening to Eric Rogel Talks with Warriors, Lovers, Kings, and Heroes today. I'm Eric Rogel, and I'm honored to be with you, to be your brother on your hero's journey. I'll talk to you next week.